Uh, so we've heard uh, about two specific programs that are, are based in medical centers, but obviously interact with uh, communities. And I think we're about to hear um, from Dr. Cunningham about some of the brief interventions that modeled similarly to um, the motivational interviewing that, um, that we've discussed and some of the intensive research that's been done around that. And so I really appreciate um, you coming and thank you. And I believe Dr. Rakba had ceded his five minutes to Dr. Cunningham. Thank you, Ali. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, so uh, thank you to the uh, National Academy for having us here today and for the vision of the Kaiser system for uh, considering these uh, important issues. It's a real honor to get to speak today. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of different programs um, with an evidence base behind them. I'm going to talk briefly about safer teens. Some main points here are uh, a focus on what we know in the past around general youth violence prevention programs. What are some validated screens to help us predict who, ha who will go on from our hospital systems to have firearm violence? We talked a little bit yesterday about multi-level multi interventions and the need for the hospital to be part of a larger community effort. And then I want to talk briefly also about our new initiative, the FACTS Consortium, which I'm just so excited about. So just to back up a little bit, we talked a lot yesterday, but it is really important that health systems and the way that we think about them on an emergency physician by training and appreciate the vast uh, showing of emergency physicians here uh, over these two days as we see so much of this on the front lines, that healthcare systems and emergency departments are a window to the community that we have. And in the community are uh, children uh, and adolescents and young adults, and of course adults also, um, who are having a myriad of problems with, uh, around violence. That community then comes to us in a graphic fashion that I think our pediatric trauma a surgeon um, uh, showed us yesterday um, and is, is something that we have come, I think, as a specialty and as Steve Hargarten spoke eloquently about yesterday in thinking about this is a medical problem that then arrives from the community to our door and how can we think about it in, in that biomedical, psychosocial way to really make change. So as an emergency physician, when we're starting to think about what we can do to have a, a decrease in that violence and in the firearm violence, what I'll talk about specifically later, as well as also in the youth violence, there's always the question, which I heard raised a lot yesterday, of where of the focus points are there to work. I'll argue that we need to be really working on all of them because this is the second leading cause of death for children in our country. Um, but we certainly need to be working a little bit more upstream. It's important to also work after the point of violent injury before people are at so high risk that uh, Ali mentioned. It's also probably important to get a little bit more upstream and think about how we can do some prevention along the way. Um, so a, a little bit of historical context, and I'm going to continue to call out, I think, some of the people in this room who have been doing work on this for a long time. In 2009, myself and Dr. Hargarten and Dr. Fine and uh, Rochelle Dicker and many others in this room, we're sp spending a lot of time thinking about what we should be doing as a community before and after the trauma bay. We have these trauma victims. They have a life before the trauma bay, before they come into us. They have a life after that trauma bay. And what is our role as a health system in that? And some of the conclusions from that review paper that we did in 2009 showed that um, many of the people who come in with youth violence utilize the ED at that time as their primary or sole access point to the healthcare system. Um, the reason we need to work at multiple points of um, uh, intervention, if we're going to think, and we'll talk for a minute just about healthcare system interventions at this point, is 97% of kids who, and adults, but of kids who are injured and are seen in an emergency department are sent home. They have no hospital admission. And so I will, that is not to minimize the incredible importance of the hospital programs that we definitely need to be working on on the surgical ward for those people that are at even more high elevated risk. But 97% of the kids who come in with any injury will go home from the emergency department that, that evening, and likely in the middle of the night, often when there's the least social work resources available. Um, from a PCARN study that Dr. Uh, Carter and actually Dr. Fine uh, and I looked at the, P the PCARN uh, national database a few years ago, we found out after a firearm injury, 52% of kids with a firearm injury go home from the ER. So there's a lay misperception that if you get shot, surely you get admitted to the hospital. You get taken care of. There's resources or care that's given to you. 52% go home that day. We stitch them up and we send them out. And although there are great programs being, that are demonstrated here that are leading the field, that is not standard of care anywhere in our country. 52% go home. 
that night, they will have no follow-up resources until the next time they come back to the ED. And then we will sew them up and we will stitch them out again and we will send them out. So we concluded in our group at that time that uh, a lot of EDs are trying to do something for violence prevention, but many are still doing no even risk assessment for even whether that youth is at risk to go out and just finish the fight that they had that started that got them there that day uh, to retaliate. Um, there's, and there's, there's been good movement in this room ar around that topic, uh, but it is not standard of care. Uh, so in about that time, in around the early 2008, 2009 time, uh, we started thinking about, and I'm so glad, Ali, we didn't coordinate our slides, that you talked about the substance use literature around brief intervention. And really, that was a landmark study and that helped a lot of the field understand that um, uh, adults and youth that have substance use and substance misuse issues, may, you know, there, it is, there is important and there is a, a long-term addiction therapy needed and resources that are needed for that. Uh, but also, there can be a lot done with a single session, and a single session in a healthcare session uh, was found to be standard of care for alcohol counseling and decreased injuries of all kinds later on. Uh, and so with good funding from the NIAAA, uh, and I'm going to continue to mention the funding sources here for two reasons. One, of course, we're appreciative for our funding. And two, I'm going to uh, continue to note that without robust funding from federal agencies, you cannot do the kind of in-depth work that needs to be done. So the NIAAA, with solid funding, gave us an R01 where we looked at, um, initially, kids who had some, uh, some alcohol use and some history of fighting and what we could do for them around violence specifically. So using that brief intervention model, uh, we developed what we've called Safer Teens. Uh, and in that upstream model of thinking about where to work, we decided to work pretty far upstream in the emergency department and to take youth that came in for any reason at all, as long as they were medically stable. They lived in a high-risk environment. I was working in Flint, Michigan. No one ever heard of Flint until not that long ago, so Flint, Michigan. Um, so high-risk youth, a lot of violence in the neighborhood. Uh, we decided to take any kid who came into the, the emergency department. We did initially some screening with them if they'd had any fights at all in the past several months, had used any alcohol at all in the past, the past few months. We would enroll them in a brief single session uh, emergency department intervention. Uh, that was, we've replicated that, by the way, which I'll talk about in a minute, to just have be any youth that came in at all for any reason with no screening, just to put that forward now. So um, what we did is while they were there, in between their medical care, stopping for their x-rays, um, uh, stopping and getting out of the way if they needed blood draw, we had a trained uh, counselor, you can see here on the right, who would go through a standard structured, theoretically driven intervention using motivational interviewing principles uh, that would go through a, a tailored intervention with them after they completed a screen on the computer. The screen on the computer facilitated some of the time that it would take from the staff. The youth could do it with earphones while they were sitting in the bed without any, um, uh, uh, without, you know, disrupting their care at all. Uh, and then they were randomized to either just complete a full intervention on the computer with no health staff engagement after that at all, or to uh, have this conversation, this 30-minute chat, essentially, structured, theoretically based with a, um, a health counselor. And then we followed them for a year. That was it, one session. Uh, we have a, a, n a number of papers and a number of outcomes on this, but uh, very similar to the slide that Ali just showed us around alcohol intervention, the yellow curve shows uh, the therapist group, the um, uh, blue curve shows the computer group. So we found that the therapist group, not to, we all, I mean, people are, computers are better than people, but the computers uh, certainly facilitated some of the intervention and kept it in a structured format. Um, this intervention, the therapist's brief 30 minute intervention, decreased peer regression over a six and 12 month period. It decreased um, peer victimization over a six month and 12 month period. It decreased the consequences kids were having in reporting in their life related to their violence. So were they having fights? Were they getting in trouble with the law because of their family? Were they getting in trouble um, uh, with their friends? Were they having problems at school because of their violence? And it decreased all of those outcomes as well. Um, uh, it also had impacts on dating violence. If, they, if the structured um, screen at the front of this identified youth that were having some dating violence as well as peer violence, and if they identified that as a risk, because we were interviewing uh, both men and women as well, and if either of those groups uh, noted that they were having any dating violence in their life, uh, then they also got a small separate conversation around how to stay safe and how to decrease either perpetration or victimization 
um, for dating violence and how that related to their life. If the youth had been reporting any dating violence in their life, we found actually the computer group helped them. Just the computer standalone alone uh, session in, for 30 minutes on itself uh, decreased their dating violence reports over the next uh, three and six month time period, including both moderate uh, and severe violence for the therapist group. Oops. Uh, we did a cost analysis of safer teens, which showed that if we took the single session 30 minute intervention and we put it into a large health system, uh, which we modeled after the PCARN network at the time, we would decrease 4,000 violent events would be prevented. And in multi-way analysis, we found that it would cost you know, somewhere between four and $55 per event prevented um, to, for a health system to implement this in all, of the, in all of the ERs. Even the worst case estimates of that cost are $55. So an IV costs uh, 417 for uh, uh, an hour in the ER. Um, I point out that the first author on this was Adam Sharp, who was, went on after he worked with us here for a little-known healthcare organization named Kaiser, um, and is in, is in their research group now. So what did we learn from Safer Teens, which again was universal intervention in a healthcare setting, not specifically for firearm injury. We did have about 5% of those kids come in for assault-related injury specifically, but they came in for sore throats, they came in for stubbed toes, they came in for all sorts of things. We had initial questions, are kids going to want to talk to us when they come in with their stubbed toe and their belly pain around violence? And the overwhelming answer is yes, these kids are incredibly interested in talking about the violence because the violence is the most important thing that's going on in their life overwhelmingly. And nobody is talking to them about that violence. So we found, what did we learn about Safer Teens? We found that even brief interventions during an acute care visit uh, can decrease violence events, that prevention in the ED can impact um, uh, you know, what's the role of the ED? Are we just supposed to be acute care? Well, no. So we can have an effect on the community besides beyond commute ca acute care. Um, the computer intervention, which would take me a lot, a lot longer to talk about, is very structured and it really guides a therapist or guides a healthcare worker in the ED. The ED is a really busy, hectic <laughs> environment and we found even our best trained therapists are not used to having um, detailed uh, psychological conversations while they are next to a curtain with a baby screaming next door. They need a structured um, format to really help them stay on track and to have um, fidelity to the intervention, which is something that's often lacking when we do further implementation. Um, I mentioned that we, with CDC funding after this, replicated uh, this as part of um, a broader uh, intervention. So we repeated our original R01 trial and found that uh, in a high-risk neighborhood, even if we did no screening at all, and we just gave this to every kid that walked into the door who lived in a certain neighborhood that we knew had risk, we decreased that kid's violent events over the next um, six months by 5%. Um, with further funding from the CDC, which we are very appreciative for, we went on to do implementation science around this. So we've packaged this intervention from the original component. We have a web page here with it. It gives all the training materials on it. Uh, the resources for it. it is now, and we are starting to roll it out in other uh, health systems. We have a training manual, we do trainings on it. Um, it is ready to be handed and used by other people uh, to deliver this 30 minute intervention. We've talked, and I've had other conversations with both folks from uh, Ujima as well as from some of the Healing Hurt People folks. It could be an adjunct to a larger wraparound program. We have no illusions that it is the solution for all violence. There's kids that have a lot more severe needs who need more wraparound care. And this is not to by any means imply that only people only need a 30 minute intervention and it's somehow just magical. However, we have kids here and while we have them here, what can we do for them? This is something we can do for them for that time. It would be great to have add on extra services after that. It would be even greater to have the funding to understand what the synergistic additive effect would be of those two. And this is where I'll give one more plug for all the great work for the National Network has done. And when I think about the work that the National Network of, violence, uh, for, of Hospital uh, Violence Programs has done in grassroots organizations growing up all around the country, and then I think about my colleagues doing stroke research funded incredibly well by, um, uh, by NIH to develop robust research networks of stroke research, and how that amount of money is needed to develop the network to harmonize the data across measures to truly understand how to change stroke care. That's what we need for the national network, is a national network that's funded um, at the level that our stroke centers are funded to actually make a difference for this, to understand the deep outcomes that uh, uh, folks like Dr. Leveus was discussing. 
Um, we've gone on to start to think about how to make this specific to firearms uh, for safer teens, and Dr. Carter has a K award on this now where he's looking at how to extend the care from what we've done in the emergency department. He has an act that he's developed that will go along and be facilitating counselor multi-session interventions following the ED, and he's in the middle of trialing that. Uh, and hopefully we'll go on to develop efficacy data to show that that actually does help for, um, for future sessions. We know that kids with firearm violence may need a higher level of care after the ED than our, our kids who had universal youth violence. Um, getting a little bit more to what we know about uh, youth after um, assault injury specifically, um, with NIDA funding we had a two-year prospective cohort study where we followed 600 youth who came into the emergency department with an assault-related injury. They were in two groups, a comparison group um, that did not have assault-related injury and a group that did have assault-related injury. And this mirrors sort of the work that was done out of the surgical hospital, um, inpatient hospital um, setting. This is from an ED. So what do we know about these youth that come in from the ED? We know uh, they're all at very high risk if, if you live in the neighborhood that, that they're in. First of all, that there's a high risk of assault following over the next time, your time period. Uh, however, if you came in with an assault-related injury, you have a 37% chance versus a 22% chance of a repeat violent injury and being seen again in, our, in, in the health system for a repeat violent injury. And when I hear people talk about we don't know if the prevention money is actually worth it or not. That kid, if they come back for one violent injury and have one trauma system activation, believe me, whatever prevention we did was just paid for in that very moment. That's the cost. The cost of the violent injury is incredibly expensive. We also know from that following that youth cohort that about 60% of the kids who come in with an assault-related injury, and I am not talking about firearm violence here, I am talking about an assault-related injury, this could have been a black eye. This could have been somebody broke their arm. This is an assault-related injury, not related to firearms. That's, this gets back to the test case you had sort of of, of Jason that broke up a uh, Ujima. Over the next two-year period, 59% of them engaged somehow with firearm violence. And what do I mean by that? They weren't all shot, but about 60% either had a firearm drawn on them, they drew a firearm on somebody, they were threatened with the gun, they shot somebody, or they were shot themselves. That's a lot of this percentage of kids if we want to identify a high-risk group. 8% actually got shot in the next two years. 70%, 77% of those who got shot, who, who had some firearm violence, said it wasn't just one time. They had multiple episodes where they were then engaged in some other firearm um, uh, altercation. Uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about what risk score do we know about that could predict future firearm injury. Using that two-year cohort story and machine learning, um, we, did, uh, we took the two-hour comprehensive assessment that we did of those youth during that cohort study over eight waves uh, over two years, uh, and we developed a safety score, risk, which predicts their future firearm violence. So these four questions um, predict fi future firearm violence, and I'll show you the data in a, in a minute. So basically, if you ask kids who came to come into the, the emergency department with uh, an assault, um, in the past six months, how often have you gotten in a serious physical fight? How many of your friends have carried a knife or gun? How many have heard guns being shot? And has someone ever pulled a gun on you? And if you do that score, we find out um, in this validation that we published in, I think, Annals of Internal Medicine uh, last year uh, with Dr. Goldstick, shows that um, this score predicts, if, uh, the higher levels of this score predict with 80 and 100 percent who will go on to have a firearm-related injury um, in the next two years. And I'm going to run out of time. Hopefully, you'll give me three more minutes, Joel. Um, Done. Is that my time down there? Yes, it's okay. also up there. Please okay. Uh, I want to uh, spend just a few more minutes before we wrap up. Uh, we're talking about the health system. I think the health system is really important, <coughs> but I really is one piece of a much larger component of how we're going to prevent both youth violence, all kinds of violence, as well as um, firearm violence. Uh, and I would encourage the, this group as they go forward to look at a lot of the really good work that was done by the CDC. The CDC, I'll, I'll say, um, gets a lot of grief because they have not been doing firearm violence for many reasons that are well known here. They've done a lot of good work on youth violence generally. And um, they funded youth violence prevention centers. We had one, Dr. Zimmerman and I, um, from about 2010 to 2014. Uh, they, they funded five of these that had a model that were supposed to look at what a multi-level intervention would do in a community to decrease violence over a certain time. So we took Flint, Michigan, uh, the map up on the right here, and we divided it into an intervention neighborhood and to a comparison neighborhood. 
And then in the intervention neighborhood, we, in, we put in basically the kitchen sink. We took six evidence-based interventions that ranged across uh, levels of ecology. Individual levels, we took Safer Teens and put it in place. Uh, school resiliency models, the evidence-based YES program. Mentoring models that we knew worked. Community policing models, as well as cleaning green initiatives like cleaning up lots within the intervention neighborhood, putting in gardens. We did all of those suite of things across those intervention neighborhood. So this is how a health system partners with a community to make it work. And what did we find? On objective data, we found that um, at the, top, the top bar there is police recorded assaults in youth 10 to 24 years old, and the red line is where they decreased. Uh, and this was a significant decrease during the time that we had the intervention going on and shortly thereafter. We also decreased objectively the number of violent injuries that presented to the emergency tar department by objective uh, counts uh, of hospital data all within the region. I have just, I'm going to take two minutes and talk about the firearm consortium and then I'll cede my time. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, we've talked a lot about youth violence programs and how some of them, with those, we've done work around uh, firearm injury. Uh, and I want to talk just a minute here about FACTS, which is um, a tremendous investment made by the NICHD in 2017. Uh, to really focus our, our work and our science on how we can focus specifically on firearm violence and what needs to be done. Um, we know from this room and from multiple other conversations that other things that have really made a difference in our country for work like motor vehicle crash, and at the top of that is the peak of motor vehicle deaths uh, in about 1965, and the list there on the right are all the investments that have been made, which is a tremendous amount of money, including agencies like NHTSA being established. And at the bottom of this is where we land with a decrease in motor vehicle crash now. So this is not, uh, these problems can be solved. They are not going to be solved without a tremendous amount of investment. Um, the investment we have to date, uh, we will note here, uh, we've had about nine firearm grants uh, from specifically the work focused on the word firearm uh, over the 10-year period between about, uh, up until about 2016. This has increased in the past couple years. There's probably about another 10 that have been funded by the NIH since then. This is a cursory review of that literature. I just want to point out that meningitis kills a lot of children and is a terrible disease. Uh, there were 585 deaths during that 10-year period from meningitis. They had 75 NIH grants. So in 2014, we had, as a country, most of the people in this room, there were about 12, less than 12, really experienced, seasoned firearm researchers really focusing boldly just on firearm violence in, 2000, in 2014. Uh, in 2016, I'll point out that firearm deaths represented 16% of all deaths, children 1 to 17. Uh, there were, in 2009, 33 total publications on the subject. So the FACTS Consortium was funded in 2017 by the NACHD to um, uh, really jumpstart the capacity that we need in this field because without the investments that we're talking about, um, all the bright investigators in this room with all the innovative ideas that are possible um, are, are not going to truly make the tremendous difference that we need. And we need a lot more people working on this. We need a lot more than 12 or 25 people working on this. Our FACTS Consortium has about 25 people, uh, 25 content experts working across disciplines and from universities uh, uh, across the, uh, the country. Um, I would, can I, if I could do a brief, uh, a bunch of people are in the room. If people are working on FACTS, can you raise your hand somewhere? We have, yeah, there's a bunch of people in the room and who were here yesterday working across a surveillance group, a risk group, secondary prevention group, primary prevention groups, looking at data, really looking at all things on how to improve firearm Re reduce firearm injury deaths among children is the focus among types of firearm injury. We're interested in suicide by firearm, which is the major cause of death for children in rural areas. We're interested in homicide by firearm, which is the major cause of death for children in urban areas. And we're interested in unintentional injury and um, accidental shootings. We have a stakeholder advisory committee, uh, which is across a broad network of uh, public agencies uh, giving us the feedback from folks that are in grassroots organizations across the ground um, that are a really important voice and I'm very appreciative. This first past year we have spent time um, building the IOM report uh, which I know Dr. Hargarten worked on and we're very appreciative of in about 2013 gave general recommendations for where the field needed to go for firearm violence. 
our group recognized that we did not have a pediatric specific firearm agenda and children are not small adults. We have, there's different issues around them. They're nested in families. We need a pediatric specific firearm agenda. We have spent the last eight months uh, working incredibly diligently getting work groups up and going. We have done uh, complete surveillance of the literature, uh, come up with scoping reviews across the literature for what's known currently about firearm violence, what works, what the risks are, what the epidemiology is. Uh, through a series of nominal group technique, we have generated uh, a research agenda of about 25 priority areas that we'll be publishing later this fall and early spring. Um, we have a website which will be a resource. Um, I want to say clearly because my communications people will hassle me. Uh, it is, will not be live until 1024. So if you click on it now, it will not be quite right. So please go back to it next week. But what you'll see on it when you get there is that um, uh, there's a couple things about this that say more than who we are as an organization. Um, this is also meant to be a repository and a data archive for firearm data. So there's not much funding out there. So the data that we have is really precious and we need to have it in a central place as much as we can that could be really easily accessible for researchers to do secondary analysis on. So with the um, backing of ICPSR and the Institute for Survey Research, which is worldwide known for this at the University of Michigan, we've developed a data archive that will hold uh, many data sets that have uh, firearm specific variables in them and we will continue to grow that with our own body of work over the next year. If you're a firearm researcher and you have data that you are now done looking at, please don't leave it on your shelf. Please contact us through this site and we will upload it and then it will be there de-identified, protected. We can figure that out with you. Um, the, a few other things we're going to do, one minute, Dr. Fine, is um, we are trying to increase the capacity for firearm researchers and we have postdoctoral positions available, we have internships avail available. Uh, we also have resources on our website. Um, there was some conversation yesterday on um, what, you know, how do pediatricians know, what, what do we do after we screen, we don't know what to do. We've developed a series of modules which are counseling videos like this one here with the pediatric resident on the left, the father and the depressed teen in the middle that demonstrate and model for young pediatricians um, uh, how specifically they can have this conversation in a non-judgmental way about safe storage um, so that they can see it in action because they don't know what to do. They don't ask about gun storage in their homes because they have no idea what to do when they get the answer. Um, so we are going to go on to do a lot of great work, but I am out of time. I will point out this NICHD website as much as I am very appreciative about uh, the NICHD funding uh, firearm injury, uh, that firearms doesn't appear here. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Cunningham, no, that's okay. Is it, um, the fact that you can't get into 20 minutes is a testament to all that you're doing.